I'm very happy to be among you today. I'd like to thank once more David Bellows for inviting me as a short-term visiting fellow at the Department of French and Italian. Um, my talk today is dedicated to freedom and creativity in the humanities. We all know what a syntax like freedom of thought means, but when it comes to being a creative historian, it's hard to know how to define it. History of ideas, literature, history of arts, deal with documents and try to say something true about them. But what does it mean to be creative when it comes to truth? Before I tackle the heavy concepts, and I will, let us be a bit practical. How freedom and creativity became a problem, you all know. In the academic world, commentaries have grown during the last 50 years in such manner that they now play a dominant role. Many factors gave birth to what we should call a uh, neo-scholasticism we are all part of. National and international institutions dedicated to research in the humanities have multiplied. The bibliography in the humanities have grown tremendously. So did our storage capacities. So did the accessibility of any kind of resource. As a result, any scholar in any discipline in the 21st century, even those, those that are not specifically oriented towards the study of books, have to refer massively to other authors. So we live in an age of commentators. In, this condi in these conditions, I take it, it is important to rethink what exactly freedom and creativity are about. Indeed, this question is not only essential to all areas of the humanities, but it is also important to protect citizens from propaganda and lies and dogmaticism and relativism. On a closer look, I should rephrase the problem as follows. How can we articulate the respect due to our sources to something that could be called freedom of interpretation? The problem becomes all the more difficult as students and scholars have been torn by a painful temporal division between past and present. Since the birth of hermeneutics, we have become aware of great differences between what comes to us from the past and what we experience in the present. This conception actually uh, comes from biblical criticism, but with Friedrich Schleiermacher, uh, it was extended to all kinds of cultural products. He believed that we should try to understand the past in its own terms, and of course, this brilliant and a fantastic idea was responsible for a fundamental shift in the ambition of interpretation. It shouldn't aim to establish the objective meaning of the words, but to achieve an understanding of the writer's or the artist's character and point of view. Then William Dilte and the Cambridge School and even Jacques Derrida's deconstruction only added a few elements to that. Here is how it basically works. You basically have two ensembles, the past and present. As you belong to the present, you formulate the questions that are relevant to you according to your cultural background. Then you ask these questions to documents of the past. Then these documents make you rephrase the questions as questions from this other cultural background called past. And then you come back to the present with very interesting alternatives. From then on, we have developed an idea of fidelity that has pulled commentary away from awareness of present time and explicit involvement in present time considerations, political militancy, reflection, self-criticism, towards a scientific ideal based on objectivity. This eventually resulted in a, in a dilemma where two orientations are in total opposition. You have to choose which side you're in. On the one hand, objectivity and rigor and fidelity to the past, for example, to the explicit text of philosophers and not to their supposed intentions or thinking. And on the other hand, appropriation and adaptation 
considered in the academic milieu as unacceptable behaviors, although these issues come back strongly, for example, when it comes to translating the text, where you have actually to, uh, to, to, uh, to translate them into, into uh, a prison dialect. All these problems I have so far formulated very poorly. To reformulate them, I will call on some good historians who have theorized that their practices, in particular those uh, who praise fidelity to the past as it helps us to get away from what they call the tyranny of the present. And I will quote him uh, here, uh, Daniel Garber, who's our colleague in the philosophy department and a great friend of mine who wrote an article entitled Towards an Antiquarian History of Philosophy. Uh, to cut it short, I would, I would summarize his, his idea as follows. Ancient forms of thought are analogous to old books and old objects. And there are three reasons why their study should be relevant. First, it highlights the permeability of philosophy to what is not philosophical, as you realize how much philosophical ideas depend on their context. So you really put the emphasis on the fact that the works, philosophical works in that case, you study belong to a certain cultural background. They're embedded in this background. The second point is that uh, it emphasizes the orientation of reason by various interests. So you realize that philosophical ideas are not totally abstract. They come from somewhere, from uh, social desires, uh, political agendas, and so on and so forth. And third, it, le it helps us get free from the tyranny, of the, the tyranny of the present. And this, I think, uh, is better understood when we refer to another scholar, who is Maurizio Bettini, uh, who published a book called Superfluous and Indispensable about what the Greek and Romans are for. And I quote, it is not the book that is sick in contemporary society, it's the text considered as a long-term act of communication that comes to us from afar. As such, by regression through time, it has the immediate power to deprovincialize our presentist arrogance or chauvinism of the present. Now, antiquarian and exotic approaches both provide us with a quite exact, exact account of our daily lives. Scholars spend lots of time in the archives, reading old editions, hunting venerable libraries. But these activities are too strongly romanticized. romanticized sorry. First, as you all know, we do not travel in time uh, because the 17th century or the Roman Empire are gone. Second, we do not talk with Queneau or Aristotle because they're dead. So the two metaphors of exoticism and antiquarians highlight three things to my understanding. First is the difference of configuration. There is something different between these cultural background and this is not to be denied. Second, uh, any work in the humanities is embedded in the general history of the human experience, that's for a fact. And third, what I like about these visions is that they account for our own transformation. That is, we return back to present time, transformed by what we've read, just like we come back from tropical countries a bit tanned, whether we like it or not. Now, these conceptions have a stronger inconvenient, is what I call the ghost spectator. They draw on, uh, on, on, on what I call the ghost spectators is they do not know how to account for what the historian is actually doing. According to them, academics collect and select data, and then they provide a synthetical interpretation which is oriented by a perspective. Well, these words to me only mean that the humanities are basically a, tra a travel agency for countries that do not exist. Uh, and again, I wouldn't mind the whole institution of daydreamers 
if the tenants of this objectivity would not try to hide and erase an important part of what they do and invert the prescriptions that would encourage the scholars to be creative. Try, they say, to be an impartial observer. And this impartiality comes actually from a legal matrix. That is, you should try to write things you cannot be trialed for. Try, they say, to make the least possible noise. And this comes from a misunderstanding of experimental sciences. That, that is, you should act and write as if you were not subject to all kinds of effects and prejudices. So the ghost spectator is not a side effect of their conception. It is the central prescription of this conception of the humanity. So basically, you consider that a historian is a ghost, such as this fantastic skeleton you see here, watching what happened in past times, you know, and trying only to describe what can be seen from that point of view. But I think, again, this prescription is, uh, is inaccurate. Uh, they should know it is not possible for human beings to be pure observers, such as ghosts. And they shouldn't be afraid of the powers of interpretation, that is, effects and experiences, when it comes to seeking the truth. And they should consider that what they are trying to hide and erase might be the most interesting part of what they do. So great historian uh, Ro Robin J. Collinwood has suggested an explicit theory of the act the historians perform in the humanities. It's in a, in a very famous book called The Idea of History, published in 1946. His concept of reenactment is meant to account for the dynamic interactions between the academics and their objects. So the reason why uh, I chose the image of a basketball field is because basically um, the reenactment theory states that if you reconstruct the premises or the conceptual space where a certain argument makes sense, and then you redo it, it's pretty much the same as if you were uh, drawing or reproducing a, a basketball field, and then you get uh, a ball. And eventually, if you do understand the lines and what this is all about, you will end up playing basketball, even if you've never seen a, a, a team playing. Uh, as Collinwood conceives philosophical thesis on the model of logical propositions, Nothing can possibly stand between Plato, for example, and us. So once you have the frame, of uh, the mind frame where it depends on, then you actually go through the argument and you react, reenact, you redo what actually uh, was in Plato's head. There is no difference. We redo the same pure abstract acts of thinking. I'll come back later to this, as something seems to me very bold and very profound here. But let us make three objections to Collinwood. Uh, first, rationality is not based on abstraction. It is not exactly a pure act. Its dynamics depend on earthly interactions. And then there would be a, a corollary to this that is, philosophical ideas are not always reducible to logically built propositions. And then, of course, uh, we miss a lot of premises, you know, coming if you really want to reconstruct the conceptual context of any argument, you have to know so many things that, as a matter of fact, some of them are missing in the model you will be building. That's the reason why I chose a pinball book that explains how to build up a pinball, because that's basically what we do. We only have spare parts for ancient uh, Athens. And from these spare parts, we keep on bumping around. So that's, that's more like it. And then thirdly, from this point of view, what we call the past is nothing more than a game involving both playing 
and gaming and as uh, uh, I'm trying to say, the best we try to reconstruct the past, the more we invent a new game without willing or we even without knowing. So I've already given uh, a conference about uh, a philosophical interpretation as a game. This game can be played up to power to the fifth, but it's a very complicated um, uh, model. So uh, this is available on YouTube. You can go and listen to this first talk I gave. I want to focus on something different today with you. Uh, first, why present time is the main problem for historians. One of the most common characteristics in theories of history is that they care very little about the present. The authors consider our belonging to the present time as something obvious and the definition of the present as a given data. Historians and critics come from a culture, they say. They have prejudices and so on. But I should ask, what culture? We know that all prejudices are not obvious. And we know that the most important ones are precisely the ones that we are not aware of. So if we were to admit we can travel to the past, we should consider first that the culture we come from is not clear at all. We literally don't know where we come from exactly. What is the distance between Diogenes and myself? I've been trained to have much respect for him, but I don't have a clue how much we differ. At that point, I'm going to draw a first analogy between what I'm trying to say and the translation theory. I'm aware that David Bellows in uh, Is That a Fish in Your Ear rejects the idea of translation being assimilated to other activities. I quote, assimilating all uses of language to translation on the grounds that all speech is a mental translation of thought seriously diminishes our capacity to understand what the practice of translation between languages is about. Turning a play into a movie has not the slightest analogy or connection with turning a coded message into another code. And to call it transcoding is to use a figure of speech based on not bothering to think what you might mean by code. This warning should make anybody think twice before drawing any comparison. But what I will actually refer to are three negative observations. I will not state at all that interpretation is a translation. I will claim that certain alleged privileges are problematic both for the translator and the interpreter. So my first observation is based on a chapter entitled Native Command, Is Your Language Really Yours? where the B criticizes the notion of native competence. So. The idea is that a native speaker is considered to have full command of his or her language. And DB points out three problems. First, any native speaker makes mistake. Uh, there are speakers who are more comfortable in other languages than the first one they, were, they learned. And then there are languages related to certain fields of activity uh, where you actually need to use them. On these grounds, uh, DB emphasizes mainly political consequences. That is, he, he really he, he goes back on, on, on uh, a debate about identity. To me, the idea that our native languages bear no privilege underlines the ambiguous status of present time, that is, of the mind frame we are supposed to receive from our present existence. Let us figure this. Uh, in the sim simplest possible model. Uh, if L1 be the language I grew in, L2 is the Latin of Spinoza. I became a specialist of. L3 is a jargon in which is expressed what has changed in me after reading Spinoza. In particular, I will be talking of substance and uh, nurturing nature and adequate cause and very weird expressions that come to me actually from Spinoza's thinking in Latin. 
This looks very clear because academics tend to jargon. They imitate both the vocabulary of those they study and the academic standards. So in the end of the day, this improbable mixture allows them to form chapels using these dialects, these strange dialects. You recognize a Spinozist in the first minutes of his speech because he uses very weird, uh, a very weird lexicon. Um, well, if you consider this as a description of social groups, I think this model makes sense. L3, L3 it says the community united by a dialect that borrows both from L1 and L2. As a group, they stand as the inter intersection between one and two. Again, if you're French and you study Spinoza, you end up being a French Spinozist. It makes sense. Now, if you consider these as organized codes, then it is extremely unsatisfactory. Now, I, I will just look at it from a conceptual point of view. If we are to consider philosophical systems, C1 does not exist because there is no such thing as a French philosophical system that I would come from. So it does not exist. Now, C2 is very imperfectly mastered because I can read Spinoza, I can talk about Spinoza, but I don't pretend to understand everything that's within this type of system. So it's imperfectly mastered. And C3, of course, does not exist because I have not built a proper philosophical my uh, system myself. So we end up with something that is extremely problematic uh, and that allows us to think that, generally speaking, any origin should be considered not as a starting point, but as a very vague landmark. So we now understand why we cannot, in any accurate manner, drag from the past into the present anything when it comes to ideas, emotions, etc. To domesticate it would be to translate from a language you don't master to a language that does not exist. So those who speak of any author's or artist's modernity, you know, oh, a Plato is so relevant for our times, or, or, or it's, it, it, Shakespeare is so actual and vivid, these sort of things, uh, they always consider the present as given. But the reason why the humanities study the past is actually to make the present happen. It is not to shed light on the present. The present, again, is not a given data. So this is basically the first proposition of this talk. What we call present time in the humanities does not refer to the observable present that we gather from the streets. This is the everyday present experience, but this is not what's involved in the humanities. Our present time is something we experience through the documents. It consists of the anomalies that appear within the experience we have as readers. The present becomes aware of itself through a sort of breach in the past as an anomaly. So there is, again, no given present to begin with. What we're dealing with is a representation of the present, which is not expressed as present, but which will be distilled into you, whoever you are, without even supposing you know who you are. In your present, however vague that is, within a certain representation of the past. So I know it seems very counterintuitive, but what I'm saying is basically that our present comes from the past and, and is only conscious uh, because of our reading of the past. But go ahead and read Plato or Thomas of Aquino. You'll see there's something strange about them and that may be something wrong with you, 
or maybe something wrong with them. But what I say is there is a paradoxical and problematic presence of two presences that overlap <coughs> during reading. Of course, none of them is very clear. We don't know who Thomas was, and you quite don't know who you are. But the reason why it's fuzzy, it's not because of the overlap. It's quite on the contrary. The overlap makes them clearer, both of them. So therefore, we can admit, uh, first, there exists something like books from Spinoza or whoever that transmitted materially and symbolically. And when we read them, there's something we don't quite understand in them. And I say what we don't understand is them, the very incomprehension we experience while reading, that is our present. <coughs> OK, second point. Uh, why a commentary should never be faithful. From now on, we're able to consider another problem central uh, to David Bellow's theory, that is the status of the transferred message, if there is any. So let us consider a chapter entitled, Why do we call it translation? To overcome the alternative between source and target, uh, DB proposes to stop thinking translation as a transfer of meaning. I quote, the metaphor of bearing a cross has generated a wide range of words, thoughts, sayings, and banalities that cannot be more than the idea that translation transfers meaning from A to B. The common terms of translation studies are metaphorical extensions, elaborations of the metaphor of the etymological meaning of the term translation itself. Now, I will draw from the impropriety of the metaphor to make an authentic analogy. Most of the difficulties in history theory come from the fact that historians figure the chronological distance as an opposition. That's the way I first presented it. Uh, once you picture two imaginary ensembles, the problem of transferring a message from the one to the other raises automatically. Now, on the contrary, once you reject the distinction of two representations of the world, that is two Weltanschauungen, the problem of transferring anything from the one to the other disappears. I do not deny that there is a difference. What I'm saying is, I deny the difference can be correctly described by this type of model. Indeed, the absence of transfer in translation invites us to think differently about the changes that occur in us while we study the works of the past. The documents of the past don't allow any kind of transfer. The text supports something that the translator or commentator make happen, although it is not produced or made up as a pure daydream or as an original production. A commentator makes use of documents, such as text and images, as elements of speech and thinking. So I would put it that way. Academics in the humanities are people who have resolved to express themselves through their references to the past, to others' writings, vocabulary, philosophical systems, artworks, etc. Their inter intervention in the present takes the form of a study of the past. Or let me rephrase this, they give form to the present through a study of the past. The past is therefore a mirror all the more effective that it is deforming in the past, what catches our attention is what is problematic in the present. So this allows, the, uh, allows us for an important conclusion. No effort is needed to domesticate the past. Quite on the contrary, you domesticate it in as much as you honestly try to say something relevant about it, something true. You don't need to inject 
arbitrary signs of presentification the interpreter has no effort to make other than to perform what he or she reads in the document the way he or she believes is correct. That's exactly what we find in music. Musicians perform what they read, but that's the way they do very different interpretations. They produce different interpretations. Again, Collinwood, Parkock, and many others believe they have access to what really happened. Well, I say, they're right to be wrong. If they didn't believe in the truth of their statements, they would not be so creative. This is that's my second point. When you comment on a book you must or artwork or whatever, you must absolutely try your best to be honest and faithful, even though there is nothing really to be faithful to. The myth of the genuine fidelity meets what D.B. calls the myth of literal translation. In reality, no one has ever translated literally, and this mythology is principally meant to free the translator. Well, it's pretty much the same for interpreters. Uh, what to do, writes D.B., with expressions that you don't understand. It's a real problem for all translators because every utterance ever made in speech or writing has something blank or fuzzy or uncertain about it. Again, the myth of fidelity works pretty much in the same way as the myth of literal translation. Almost no one, except maybe Collinwood, thinks he is absolutely faithful. Again, it's unclear what to be faithful to but I would say uh, you should be faithful uh, not really to the past but to actual people who live in your present time and who are your colleagues. Um, so I will not comment too much on, on this but what I want to say is uh, when you come to that point it, that is thinking that fidelity is not towards a text or a document, but towards uh, what I call a truth-finding procedures, we are coming extremely close to Habermas conventionalism. That is, truth is defined as what we can agree on. And of course, it's, it's to be debated and negotiated indefinitely. Now, I think this part of the theory has mainly a negative importance. It helps fighting against dogmaticism. But there is some kind of feedback between the objects and the circle of academics, in our case, um, that's who are studying it. So there is some kind of interaction between the Holy Grail here at the center of the table and uh, the knights that are uh, united around it. And this is what I want to describe now as turbulence, so the theory of turbulences through the space-time wormhole. This is the very hardcore part of this talk. So I apologize for the technicality of what I'm going to say, but sometimes life is, is not simple and uh, uh, it's not my responsibility, okay? <laughs> so I didn't mean it to be that way, but we really have to face some complex things. Now, here it is. My purpose here is to describe what happened to us that made us embrace the peculiar activity of studying the humanities. I'm, I'm sure many members of your families have, have made this uh, question to you because it's so weird that you should uh, dedicate your whole life to things of the past. I want to give an account of the encounter between uh, a live person and a document. Okay, to do this, I will need to use uh, what is called a wormhole um, or an Einstein Hosen bridge. It's a very simple um, mathematic structure uh, that is basically the following. If you consider two uh, points separated in, in space time, for example, here on this sheet, there, there, is, there is a distance between them that is insuperable. You, you cannot. But if you fold the paper, then 
you eventually the distance is abolished because the distance is only in the two dimension space if you look at the three dimension space you can consider the distance is null so that's that's basically what an einstein rosen bridge is about it's an extra dimensional bridge that makes two distant points one and the same right <coughs> So as, as you understand, a wormhole is a speculative structure linking desperate, disparate points in space-time. And this, to me, can help describe the relationship between distinct persons located at different times. So here is you. You as a reader, for example, and one day you come across some cultural elements as you were walking through a library and you meet a book or it's music you hear or it's artworks that have been placed on your path by others who meant to trap you in it. And something happens, there is an interaction between you and what I call a breach, that is, you, you moved. Uh, the document is sort of talking to you. It touches you. It moves you. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we do not even know why we choose all points of interest. There are lots of hazards and trivial determinations. So if a historian is interested by an object, uh, it's first necessarily for wrong reasons. Uh, for example, you identified yourself with Nietzsche because you thought you were one of these aristocrats uh, uh, seeking for power. So uh, basically, the reason why you enter the wormhole uh, are confirmation biases and other heuristics. You really believe your niche or you identify yourself or you think that's actually what you, you've always thought about life and human being or whatever. But this is unreliable and partly based on misunderstandings. So I would say to discover reasons for our interest is precisely why we investigate. It's not only because I'm interested in Spinoza that I study his texts, but it is also because I study them that I discover what I am interested in so that I can make something out of my reading. <coughs> But as you depend, uh, as you deepen your research, you read more books, you confront more archives, you have to deal with cognitive dissonances because some elements are no longer consistent with the confirmation that you came looking for. And these open up breaches in your representation of the world. These are what I call turbulences of meaning. You were expecting Nietzsche or Spinoza or whoever or Cano to say something you actually believe in, but he's, something, he's saying something different. And actually, he was talking about something you were not expecting. And now you come with a cognitive dissonance, and you have to deal with it. During these turbulences, the historian does not penetrate the world of the other a past world or uh, another culture, if you're an anthropologist, because this is literally impossible. What happens is that you abstract yourself from your, pre your present location. You don't penetrate the other's culture or thought. What happens is that you're just losing the one you never really had. So what happens is not communication or circulation as if the tube, this cylinder that stands for the Einstein-Rosen bridge, was spatial. By the opening of the wormhole, the two points of departure and arrival are in a spatial temporal indistinction. So what you could say circulates in between is something that is actually totally indistinct. And I don't know, I'm open to suggestions, I don't know if I should call it 
energy or emotion or desire or absurdity or nothing actually i think to name it is a mistake why because the wormhole designates an interval between two fuzzy worlds it's a point of view that makes the two one so you cannot formulate it abstractly as it is a breach from the moment you formulate it you drag its flow to your side which is a legitimate natural and necessary move that's the reason why you eventually talk say something so the desire to express oneself that tackles the wormhole has any rights within the limits of its jurisdiction. This is why and how we shall and must be creative within the limits defined by the circle of our fellow specialists, which are not laws, but jurisprudences, we can say whatever seems important to us. You can do with Spinoza or with Cano or with whoever. Whatever you want, once you respect, once again, the, the norms of your fellow, of your partners in, in, in seeking the truth. But once again, you should be open to whatever comes from, from the turbulences you experience in, in the direct contact with the documents. If you can just do that, your own interpretation will be a breach for the future. This consideration of the future doesn't come out from some kind of moral conscience or political objective. It's the result of a perfectly blind structural mechanism. Why? Because the wormhole has the property of disregarding space-time coordinates. So what you actually say of some past author will be considered as a past interpretation for uh, the next generation of scholars. So you're actually part of, the, of a, uh, a wormhole. Actu actually, it's a turbulence going through time, which you can enter losing your coordinates in space-time. Ultimately, as much as the poet, the historian, speaks by an effect of inspiration or aspiration which doesn't come from the past but from a gap where we place ourselves and this gap aspires and motivates us that is what makes our studies significant or relevant it's not what where they come from you see the relevance of our studies doesn't come from the problems that initiated them. Because this, again, this is very peculiar. This is something very specific to you. The reason why you were involved in the study you're in, that is something that is only relevant to you. But what makes it uh, shareable, so to speak, is that its meaning uh, is the incontrollable impact that these studies will have in turn on those who read them. And this is something that is not in the hands of the speakers. So it's, it's a strange thing to think, but knowledge does not receive its meaning from itself, but from its audience. And our audience is not the circle of specialists who study the same thing. If the humanities play a role for the entire society, it implies that the meaning of the wormhole is not produced inside the wormhole. Its meaning arises from other external interactions between the discourses emerging from the, worm the wormhole and the ones who listen to them. It's there in our external interactions that the future is being built. So then the historian speech becomes a proposition, and this proposition, as I just said, does not belong to him or her. Whether he or she explicitly claims a certain meaning or refuses it fiercely, this doesn't matter. 
because the way we ser research builds the future does not belong to anyone. As a conclusion, uh, it is striking that the models have tried to uh, the models that have tried to account for what historians actually do in the humanities rarely consider the interactions that the present blindly engages with the future. And it is on this blindness that I would like to conclude. What I have proposed claims to overcome realistic beliefs and constructivist assumptions. As you see, uh, this model is not a constructivism, but it's an interactionism. It is in the interaction that the past becomes past for the present, and that the present is revealed to itself and becomes available for the future. So just a few tips of wormhole enforcing before you go. Uh, in the turbulences of the wormhole, any commentator is most welcome to play. That's what wormholes are, are about. They're turbulences, and it's for you to play pretty much as waves in the ocean. Go and play in them. But there are certain rules. If you don't want to totally you lose your sense of truth, just as you sort of lose yourself when you're in the, uh, in the waves. First, avoid forcing the past to meet the present. That is dogmatic historicism. That is when you actually believe that the vision you have of France in the 20th century or Greece in the 4th century BC or whatever is actually what happened. Second, avoid forcing the present back into the past. And this is what we all call anachronisms. And then consider the norms, that is the truth-seeking norms as jurisprudences, but you're more free than what you think of these norms. And I tried to experience this writing a Spinoza biography as a novel. I was quite surprised that my colleagues in, uh, in the philosophy department accepted as a valuable um, work but do not consider it relevant for academic studies. And I'm very surprised because it's used now in Europe as the new grounds for, uh, uh, for interpretations of Spinoza and his circle. So again, I think we should challenge the norms because they open uh, new lines of, of thinking. And then eventually, to make one's contribution a breach for the future is something we should consider when we defend our ideas. That is, the idea that it is important for us to make our interlocutor, interlocutors believe what we actually say is something we should actually uh, struggle against. Mm -hmm. We don't have to convince anybody because the um, health of uh, an academic ecosystem depends on its plurality. But it is something that I should, I should um, explain more thoroughly. I think I've, I've talked enough today, and it's time for us to interact. So thank you very much for your attention.